children of the same seed. A wheelhouse is all I have left of the Kennedy, the fishing boat that fed my family for 40 years. My father maintained her lovingly until he died. He was already dying of cancer when he decided that his boat had to move with the times. So we had her renovated, put in new electrical equipment, and constructed a larger cabin. The Kennedy was his home. On her, he had spent countless calm and temp tempestuous days and innumerable nights, both nerve-wracking and rewarding. She was his world, and he would never abandon her. He had made great sacrifices and taken serious risks to build and maintain this boat. It was everything to him. We had to sell her after he died. When the fisherman from Anzio, who had bought her, came to Lampudessa and picked her up, I wept on the pier like a child. It was on the Kennedy that I learned to be a seaman and a fisherman, and trained myself to grow a strong stomach. That was where I discovered the meaning of exhaustion and of self-denial, and where my best moments with my father took place. He had wanted me to be tough and fearless. My worst moments, in which I had been frightened for my life, were also on the Kennedy. There I had felt real hunger and known how to celebrate a good catch. Above all, on the Kennedy I had learned to love the sea. I developed an intrinsic need for it. I could not live without it. For my father, too, the sea was everything. When his illness got the better of him, he stopped going out on the Kennedy and returned to our old Pilachiera, which was smaller and easier to control. Since he could not do it alone anymore, he often asked me to go down to the pier with him and help him aboard. But he never asked me to accompany him out to sea, not that I would have been able to go anyway, since I was needed back to the clinic. Invariably, he returned with the pilachiera, full of fish. People called him obstinate, saying he should not be going out in his condition. I asked him why he kept fishing even though he barely had the strength for it. Because it is the only weapon I have against this monster that is devouring me, he said, because it is my life. And so I continued to help him. When he came back to port with his catch, his face was always white with salt. The water would splash onto his face and then dry in the burning sun, leaving behind a layer of salt, like a mask of sorts. It was a mask that revealed the authenticity of his being instead of hiding it, a mask that permitted no falsehoods. I see the same mask on the face of the despairing migrants who have spent days at seas tossed by the waves. Every time I see them, I think of my father. They are children of the same seed. My father would come home exhausted but never defeated. The stabbing pains he experienced were growing worse, and tears would sometimes roll down his cheeks, dissolving the salt on his skin. They were tears of salt. Eventually, he stopped asking me to go down to the pier. The cancer had won, and one morning he asked, me, he asked for me, Pietro, I have to ask one last thing of you, he said. His voice was feeble by then. Take a garland of flowers and throw it into the sea for me. He kissed me and closed his eyes. On the day of the funeral, I went to the forest and had them make a colorful garland with three simple words on the ribbon, for you, Papa. I boarded the pilachera and revved up the motor. I went far out onto the open sea, then I took the garland and tossed it into the water. My father's wish had been granted. Acknowledgements. The idea of recounting the past 25 years of my life and work arose from an interview with Lydia Telota at the clinic of Lampudessa as we looked at Nino Randazzo's photographs of the tragedy of October 3rd, 2013. Those photographs started a conversation that continues to this day has been amplified by Gianfranco Rossi and his magnif magnificent film, Fire at Sea. I would especially like to thank the members of the uniformed forces with whom I have worked for all these years. The Port Authority's Coast Guard, the Guardia de Finanza, the police, the Carabinieri, and the Fire Brigade. These young men are the guardian angels of the sea. With courage, dedication, and humanity, they rescue men, women, and children in good weather and bad, and they dive into the depths to bring back their bodies. 
I would like to thank my colleagues at the clinic who helped me, support me, and put up with me every day, as well as the volunteers who become refugees arriving by sea on Favolado Pier and the many interpreters. I would also like to thank the Lampudesans who are an ever generous and welcoming people. Thanks to Paola, Paola, Marcela, she knows why. Thanks to my family, to Rita, my life companion, and to Grazia, Rosana, and Giacomo, my children who encourage and uphold me in my work and the choices I have made. Thanks to the public health authorities in Palermo, on whom we depend and who constantly provide us with what we need in the form of both equipment and manpower. Finally, I would like to thank my dear friend Don Memo, who labors through the silence, Pietro Bartalo. My thanks are due, first of all, to Pietro Bartalo for entrusting his story to me and confiding in me the memories he had accumulated over the course of a lifetime. Every anecdote was recounted to me in a voice rich with unfiltered emotion, Pietro's voice. His testimony is both genuine and powerful. The process of collating and recording these recollections was challenging, and we revisited them together with Rita, who was forever at his side. Next, my thanks goes to our editor, Nicoleta Lazari, who guided me expertly through a complicated process with innumerable obstacles going above and beyond the responsibilities of her role. I want to thank my whole big family who have supported, inspired, and encouraged me to keep going over the past months. Thanks to my life partner, Salvo, and my son, Giuseppe, whose criticism, criticisms are always helpful. Thanks to my second father and brother, Nino, my sister, Carmela, and my friend, Silvana, who were involved in the beginning of this journey. They know how. I must thank my broadcaster, the RAI, and my news station, TGR, for allowing me to cover the stories of people fleeing war, dictatorship, and misery over years spent on both sides of the Mediterranean shores. They made it possible for me to meet special people like Pietro Bartalo, thanks to Ezio Bolso, whose music was a soundtrack to the writing of these pages. The book, this book is an eyewitness account, put down on paper just as it is, black and white, without filters or embellishment. It has not been easy. Lydia Telota. Letters to Pietro Bartalo. Dear Doctor Bartalo, what you said on television touched and wounded me. I was a child during the Second World War and the resistance was strong in my village. My brother and I had to watch the executions of 18 young men. I waited to send this because I was not convinced I should, but now I am sure. I've enclosed 50 yards for a box of biscuits for a little one who has been rescued from a very old Italian granny. Please forgive me for writing directly to you. God bless you and thank you for everything. See. Looking into your eyes on the television moved me as I thought of how much pain and desperation they must have witnessed. I wish I could take your hands in mine and give you a great big hug. As long as there are people like you on earth, there is hope for us. I would love to meet you in person, but even though we are far apart, I am with you in spirit. Love. M. I listen attentively to your heartfelt words about people like us with hands, legs, eyes, mouths, and hearts like ours. They are less fortunate than we are, but otherwise akin to us in every way. You spoke of children, women, and men who suffer agonies inflicted not by God, but by subhuman monsters. I am envious of your generosity and only too aware of my own uselessness. You have shown so much understanding, solidarity, and sensitivity. I am proud of you and profoundly grateful for your selfless love toward these unloved people. A.